New World Witchery is a Patreon-supported podcast. This episode is supported by listener Liz. And to show our thanks, we're putting a very magical sticky note in your lunchbox. Be careful, because it's been known to summon demons. And Fluffernutter sandwiches, weirdly. Use at your own risk. If you'd like to become a patron and help support the show while also getting some great perks, please visit www.patreon.com slash newworldwitchery, where you can pledge a dollar a month or whatever you can to help us buy some more enchanted marshmallow fluff to help keep Liz's lunchbox well supplied. And thanks to all of our listeners. Are you looking for magic? Maybe magic that lives right where you do? If so, join us aboard our broomsticks and ride with us from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Yukon to the Yucatan, and find magic that's right outside your front door or just off of Route 66. Whether you're in the Windy City or the Crescent City, the city that never sleeps or the city of brotherly love, we've got enchantment for you. I'm Corey. And I'm Lane. And this is New World Witchery. It's time for pencils, protractors, and pentagrams as we go back to school. We'll be talking about our experiences both teaching and learning witchcraft, as well as some thoughts on folk magical uses of some common school supplies. Is it weird to talk about fluffernutter sandwiches? Like, do you, you know what those are, right? I love fluffernutter sandwiches. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> like, it occurred to me, it was like, that seemed like a really, like, regionally specific thing up in Pennsylvania, but I was like, but I remember learning about them as a kid so surely they're not that regional i don't know no i, I thought if if they were regional i thought they were southern so Ooh, this that may be turf war. yeah that may be my bias showing <laughs> this this is where the new civil war really starts <laughs> <laughs> who who can lay claim to the fluffer nutter <laughs> which That'll is a... peanut butter and marshmallow fluff yes on white bread yes it has to be white <laughs> who does it does it yes <laughs> Oh, that's what I said, bunny bread. Okay, (laughs) the angriest emails we will get all year will be (laughs) over fluffer nutters. Oh, hi, Lane. How's it going? Uh, it's it's going, (laughs) it's going. How are you? It's also it's going. I think, I think the phrase I used when talking to somebody earlier was like, This you can just go sit on a jellyfish. That's all I all I feel on this. Yeah, because it's you have had some health issues, right? Yeah, I've just, ever since my infusion, I, my, you know, immune system was down and I've just been sick basically ever since. I mean, and I've kind of gotten better a few times, but then like just immediately get knocked back down. Yeah. So I'm, you know, really trying to take some better care of myself. I mean, I always try to take care of myself, but it's just, yeah, it's been a really rough, I don't know, like six months now, something yeah. like that. And then we're getting really really busy so like i have a europe trip in a couple weeks Mm -hmm. lord willing and the creek don't rise because i've got some passport stuff that's my own fault but anyway um trying to deal with that and then you know we're going to disney in october which i'm very excited about but you know it's another big trip um and then september is birthday month (laughs) for for us so mine's at the end of august and then my husband's and then my daughters at the end of September so it's just a lot it's a lot going on but we also have a book coming up in September we do and also I'm gonna say I'm just really excited to give you your birthday gift but that's you're gonna have to wait regardless it's just ah there's so much going on um this this isn't even witchcraft this is just like catch up with Corian Lane hi indeed (laughs) catch up and mustard (laughs) yes one's sweet one's a little tangy Oh my gosh. So, Anything to say to that? I don't know. I know. What do we say with that? But yeah, no, you're right. The book is coming out. We have a pub date for it. So it will be in theory published on September 19th. 19th. Oh my God. It was almost mm-hmm. my daughter's birthday. And I was like, I could have two babies on that day. But no, <laughs> it didn't happen that way, but that's okay. That's fine. I, I like that. It's kind of, it's right there around Michaelmas. It's right there. Kind of the, the fall equinox. It's mm-hmm. kind of a, a fun, you know, turning of the seasons kind of moment i love that and it'll be available for pre-order if all goes well with our publisher's website i think the very beginning of september so not too long after this episode is out or maybe like right as this episode is is coming out Mm -hmm. i think around the fifth is when we're hoping yep but 
but yeah, we'll obviously have links and everything, but we're so excited and grateful for, you know, anyone who wants to support that and if not, no big deal. You know, this isn't like <laughs> a big push or anything. It's just, we're so excited. Buy our book. <laughs> or else. <laughs> I'm just going to like subtly under, under this entire episode, it's just going to be backwards. Like buy our book, buy our book, buy. <laughs> like just constantly. I just thought of right. the Simpsons, like even at <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Is that the one where Millhouse is like the one who's saying, or no, no, Rag, that's Rag Q Sip or something like that, right? I can't, it's like the, join the Navy or backwards and they're like saying, yeah. like, Eva Natnia. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking, is the, there's someone there's like Rag Q Sip or something like that. And it's, it's pick up Bart backwards. <laughs> it's so weird that I have some of these references because I was not allowed to watch The Simpsons growing up. I, I wasn't for a certain amount of time, but then, I mean, I made up for that. I've seen mm -hmm. a ton of those episodes multiple times. So anyway, <laughs> that's hi. not what we're here to talk about. We're yeah. here to talk about back to school yep, and witchcraft. And really, this is this is an episode that's all about kind of witchcraft in the sort of educational space. Not, <laughs> not that being said right now, the educational space that surrounds us contemporarily to to when we're recording this there's a lot of debate and fighting over education and what can be done in schools what can't be done in schools and there's some really negative stuff that's happening we're not going to get into that we're not going to get into this like what is the political side of all that what we're talking really about is our experiences teaching and learning witchcraft and then also to some extent you know the, the the actual kind of fun part of it is the well i mean all of it's fun but the fun the fun like school supply magic what can you do with your school supplies that's magical too so we've got kind of two halves to this so yeah it's like witches love jars but witches love school supplies too <laughs> witches do love school supplies <laughs> so you can take a witch to a state like stationary shopping and you will lose them for like three hours it's great mm -hmm. it's because like there's so much we can do with it i mean not everything that a witch does is like just thinking about witchcraft, obviously, but right. I, I do think that there's, there's something to that. For we're just, sure. We're, we're more, we're more magpie in general, I think as a group. That is true. We are very much, we are very much a magpie sort of attitude group of people. So I think that that's a good way to put it. And to think about this, like we like to, we're collectors, right? We collect the little bits and pieces, the sort of detritus of, of the world around us. And then we, turn that around and make something out of it that's not always sensical or sensible but is maybe perhaps a little bit more wondrous and that's that's you know a big part of witchcraft for at least for me i don't know so, mm -hmm. i agree it's a cool way to put it yeah and we have talked a little bit about this before but when i say before i really need to clarify that i am talking about over 10 years ago <laughs> 2012 maybe 2012 <laughs> yeah um so back then we basically did a it was a, what we called a special episode i don't even have a frame of reference for what that would be anymore <laughs> but i guess these were like one-offs that were kind of really topic specific and we decided to talk about learning witchcraft and so that was kind of the closest we came to the sort of educational space of witchcraft and in there we talked about initiation apprenticeship and learning in a group versus learning solitary. So mm -hmm. I remember talking about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So with, with your power of memory of a decade ago, what do you remember? Like your attitudes, your thoughts were back then about those things. I, I remember a lot about the solitary versus group. I feel like it was mm -hmm. a lot of like, you know, group work can be really rewarding and fun, but it's so hard to find one that suits you. And I feel like now even more so because, you know, now that we're post pandemic, it's like, I don't know. It's just harder to be in person now. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. What are your thoughts? <laughs> that was a quick throwback to me. Well, I'm, I'm really trying to be just not like ramble on and be like, you know, word vomit, like, <laughs> anyway, no, no. go ahead. No, no, this is what Led Zeppelin's talking about, baby. We, we run alone. You know, sorry, <laughs> that was terrible. That was today. I don't know. <laughs> so I do remember us talking about the solitary versus group thing. I will say, and I, I agree with you, I agree with you on kind of one side of it, which is that the, the pandemic and sort of the post-pandemic space has opened us up to a lot of 
people finding their way on their own because people had so much time to themselves and maybe did a lot of exploring on their own. And maybe there's been some movement into sort of a virtual space and virtual connection and virtual learning. I know for a fact that there are, there are definitely witchcraft lessons that you can take online from a lot of people that you can kind of form a community, but it's a community that sort of exists around the course material um, and not necessarily around, you know, who you're, who you're in that sort of cohort with. Yeah. Like the community itself. Yeah. Yeah. But then the flip side of that is I think that we have some really amazing tools for creating community that have a lot of people to start learning from each other. And I mean, our good evidence of this would just be our discord server where we have a bunch of people, not all of them from the same background, but they share so much information with each other. And I love it. <laughs> like I go in and I just watch conversations happen. I'm like, Ooh, what's that herb do? <laughs> like, it's so great. Well, the, the way you say it, like from so many different traditions and things like that, mm-hmm. it kind of makes me think of when we were at Mystic South, when yeah. we made the silly TikTok of like, yes. You know, like a bunch of witches all sitting together. Like this is a, a Wiccan and this is, I don't know how everybody different types of people there were, but like, you know, we, we're we all sitting here and getting along. Where's getting your along. white stage now, Wiccan? <laughs> yeah, that was a joke. That was a part of the TikTok joke but, <laughs> that we all then broke into a fight. But yeah, and I do think that there is a, there is a, and actually the Mystic South thing that one of the things that was really interesting, and I think it was Keldon who I was talking to where we got into this, although it may have been Thorn Mooney, about talking about the fact that like, you can have all these different traditions. And if you actually get in the same space with each other, you have so much in common and you wind up in such positive conversations with one another. Uh-huh. But if you stay kind of in your corners online, sometimes it can be isolating and adversarial. Yeah, an echo chambery, and I think that's the case with almost anything. So yeah, it's it's important to be careful of echo chambers. I think for sure, for sure, it's just good advice in general. Yeah, and then you know the other two things that we talked about back then were initiation and apprenticeship. Yeah, and- I do remember a lot about like hereditary witches, you know, and like oh, I, my great great grandmother was, so I'm more valid than you, and that was kind of like. A thing, I guess. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, no. I mean, really, in that sort of 2005 to 2015 space, there was a really like there was a lot of chatter about people sort of trying to establish non Wiccan witchcraft lineages that were sort of family traditions. Which I mean, if p- people have those, that's fine. But in a lot of cases, people were kind of falsifying credentials or were, you know, exaggerating things that were sort of part of their family history or lore well and that all kind of what am i trying to say (laughs) it's all to say that this isn't this is more important than people who don't come from that lineage which is not true so it's 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 not necessarily that they were even making stuff up which yeah is bad but like (laughs) just that they were then able to use those lies and say oh well that makes me better and there's just no such thing Right. Yeah. It somehow makes their witchcraft more valid in some way. Yeah. Which is, yeah, like you said, it's just not, not the case. And I thought that was interesting. And I, you know, I think back then we also kind of debated this whole idea of like, do you need initiation to practice witchcraft? I mean, if you're talking about being instructed, initiation is usually a part of that instruction. Although I would say not every witchcraft or magical tradition has a formal initiation. You may have an informal one in the sense that you sort of have learned and you cross the threshold somewhere in the process of learning, but the actual formal initiations, those are specific to traditions, particular traditions, and not all traditions have those. So, Mm -hmm. but I don't know, like, what do you think about initiation? Is it something, because we did do an initiation. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that has changed your witchcraft or changed your relationship with witchcraft? I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I I don't, I don't think so because I don't really feel much different Mm -hmm. than I did at the time. I mean, I think the ritual was very interesting. I'm Mm -hmm. glad that I did it. I, it was a, a cool experience and a, you know, there was some kind of historical stuff that you threw in there that was really interesting for me to learn about and to participate in. And like one thing, for example, is I memorized a lot more than, like, I'm usually not very good at that aspect of, I guess. And, you know, 
a lot of witchcraft can be kind of performative when you're with other people. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I was really surprised at how much I remembered as well. Mm -hmm. So I I guess it it was like, yeah, this, this is really important to me, but I, I don't know that, but again, I don't know that that necessarily changed like how I did anything or really like how I practiced. Yeah. I mean, and like, if you think about it now, like if you go to put together a spell or you go to, you know, do any kind of like ceremony to honor the moon or whatever you're going to do, do you look back to that initiation and sort of pause and go, like, is that, are you thinking about it in any capacity, like when you're performing whatever work you're doing, or is it just something that's kind of like, it's a thing that happened in my past and maybe was valuable at the time, but it doesn't define my practice now. Like how, how do you kind of feel? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like that. Okay. Yeah. Now, have you done initiations? I have. So I've been initiated into three different traditions, one of which I have sort of disavowed in intervening years. And I don't make a big public stink about it, but it was just a, it's a tradition that I don't feel comfortable elevating in any way anymore. <laughs> and then one that I am still involved with and that I still teach for. And I, and I generally do enjoy teaching within that tradition, although I uh, I had a, a slightly bigger role at one point and I decided to step back from that because I, because this year I can go sit on a jellyfish among other things. And so I knew I wasn't really giving, giving the tradition enough of my focus and my energy to, to be able to fill that role adequately. And they were obviously very understanding. It's this, the, the, it's a very established and strong and solid tradition with a lot of support built into it. So So that one's been very good. And then you and I had kind of our initiatory ceremony. And that one actually, I will say, was incredibly moving for me at the time. And I still, I do still kind of look back on it and go, I have some, I have some vows. I have some obligations based on that initiation that I, I carry with me, but it doesn't necessarily reflect like, like every time I go to do a spell, that's not necessarily the first thing I think about, but I do think back on it sometimes. And I think, that was a very powerful experience. And the time around that experience was very powerful too. Cause a lot of, a lot of very uncanny things kind of happened in that process. So. Yes. Yeah. We were working together a lot. Our, yeah. our creative energy <laughs> was really like just working together really well. Yes. Yeah. Which kind of touches on this idea of apprenticeship, like where you find either a partner or you find someone who is trying to learn and that you have a little more experience and you know, it's not a sort of like, I have all the power and you have none and you must claim it. There can be only one and you have to fight until they cut your head off and absorb your power in a lightning storm. But it's not that it's much more of a, I think in a, a good apprenticeship is somebody that has skills is able to guide somebody who is trying to acquire those skills. But the idea is that if that this, this is a chain where those skills continue to be passed down and, and developed and refined. And that sometimes the apprentice winds up able to instruct the, the quote unquote master at some point as well, because they, they surpass them or they reach a different kind of skill level. So. Mm, mm-hmm. Or they just bring in new ideas. Yes. Mm-hmm, exactly. Which I think is nice. Like, you know, I had been working with kind of the same framework for years because it was really all I knew, which was from some of my, my friends, you know, from like high school going into college and when I was really like getting into Wicca and things like that. So that was really what, informed my practice at that time and then I met you and started practicing with you and immediately it was different and I was like oh you know I can mix things up and it doesn't have to be this specific way that I've been doing it and I that might have been part of the like the burst in creativity Mm and that like both of us kind of playing off of new experiences new new things that we were bringing you know just like I said to our practice for sure. Yeah. And I mean, and we were both reaching kind of back into the past to pull some stuff that existed and, you know, develop some stuff out of that, the, you know, historical practices and things. But we were also being improvisational and mm-hmm. we were really good at that, actually, when we were, you know, working together, that that actually helps a lot. And I think that was one of the things I, I would say, if I do look back on this sort of initiatory experience, it was that it was a partnership and that our work together was really, really meaningful. So, Mm -hmm. and is still, but in a different way, obviously. So, obviously, yes. I think that's cool to think of an apprenticeship as like a partnership as well. I kind of Mm -hmm. never really 
I mean, obviously it is, but I never really thought of it that way. I was always like, you know, master and then learner or whatever, teacher and then student. But yeah, it, I think it can be more just two people learning from each other. Yeah, it's a dialogue. And I mean, I think in that situation, like, you know, any point throughout our kind of work together, either on the show or in magical practice, like if you were wanting to know something that was kind of historically based or folklore based, you generally kind of deferred to me on that because that was kind of where, where I, where my strength was. Right. Mm -hmm. But when it came to sort of being like, how can we, how can we improvise this and make this work now? How can we make this and tweak this a little bit and have it be more effective? How can we experiment? You were very, very good at introducing and are very, very good at introducing that sort of like, let's play with this a minute, you know? Yeah. I started to say that's not really changed that much. That's still mm -hmm. kind of our dynamic and how it we is. do things now. Yeah. So I think it's a, a, a long-term apprenticeship, partnership, mm -hmm. friendship. Yeah. Friendship. <laughs> the power, the magic of friendship. Friendship <laughs> is magic, my little ponies. Friendship is magic. It's true. Friendship okay. is witchcraft. Okay. <laughs> friendship is witchcraft. <gasps> okay. So that's kind of where we came from back in 2012 and kind of where we are now. But in that intervening time, you know, since 2012 and really since 2010 when we started this, We've had a lot of opportunities to both take classes, take courses of various kinds in certain aspects of magic or witchcraft, or just something, even anything kind of tangentially related to, to the topic and learn from other people and not just kind of us or books, but like actually learn from other people. And then we've also had a couple of opportunities to teach other people as well. And so I wanted to kind of break those down and talk about some of the experiences we've had and, you know, what are some of the, you know, memorable classes that you've taken or, or memorable, maybe not classes that you've taught or, but, you know, situations where you have taught somebody else something okay. magical. So do you want to start with learning or teaching? Let's start with learning. Cool. So what are some classes that you've enjoyed? Hmm. I'm trying to think of ones I've taken besides Mystic South. Like those count for sure. Well, I, I know, but those are so recent. I, I'm like, do I have any others in my past that I'm not remembering? Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I feel like we did a little bit of online learning at one point, but, but it wasn't like a formalized online learning thing. Mm -mm. So, so yeah, I mean, Mystic South may be kind of the, the biggest I'm best example of that, but you went to a couple different classes over the two different years that we've been there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would, would do any of them kind of pop to mind as like, oh yeah, that was a really fun one. Or that was like I, one that like was meaningful to me. I mean, the sigil one was really cool. I really mm -hmm. liked the drawing with, with everyone and kind of seeing what came about. Mm -hmm. I got her book. I still need to <laughs> crack that open, but that's for another month. <laughs> well, and we're doing that. We're doing that in our book club this month. If you, if you want to read oh, it that's Sunday. right. That's right. Yeah. I need to, <laughs> I need to just join in with that. Yeah. Oh, but you, um, you don't have to read it in detail. You can just kind of skim and yeah. still participate. So, <laughs> but um, I yeah. mean, they all kind of ha have a place in my heart, you know, like they, they all mean something. I, I mean, maybe that, that sounds a little like, twee I guess but I don't have the opportunity to take many things like that you know like especially in such a way that like I can really feel like I can truly be myself mm -hmm. so I don't know I just really appreciate the the chances that I've had and all of the classes that I've been to fair enough fair enough. yeah yeah I know that you went to Thorne's one on magical journaling last year right mm -hmm. and journaling something that you already kind of do so I don't know if that impacted your practice of it in any way or not or if it was just kind of like it's really fun to look at other people's journals so but, uh, yeah both I, I yeah. love I mean one thing I've kind of taken with me is you know she was like don't like save your good like, you know just use them who cares and then who cares if it's a little bit written in on one and then a little bit written in on another it doesn't like you don't have to just keep everything to one notebook and use it up and then move to your next like I have like literally five or six notebooks going right now and I'm totally at peace with that. <laughs> yeah. Which is, I mean, it doesn't sound like it's a magical lesson, but it kind of is right. Yeah. Like Sometimes you have to just try to juggle things as much as you can. Right. That's the magician card in the tarot, right. It's, mm. You're doing lots of things, lots of tools at once. So mm -hmm. yeah, I love that. Yeah. 
what are what are some classes that stand out for you? Oh, and so I have I have taken a fair number of classes over the years, mostly online. I mean, and some some in person. There was one that was a candle dressing class that I took at the Hoodoo Kentucky Hoodoo and Rootwork Festival that I still think about, and I think the that sounds neat. Yeah, yeah. I think the instructor that I remember was, I think her name was Temperance. It's not temp- Temperance Alden. It's, it was a different person. But she was doing this in- really interesting thing with candle dressing that she had picked up. And I don't, you know, I'm not going to share kind of her techniques because those are hers and something that I learned in that class specifically from her. But it was really fascinating. And since then, I have kind of incorporated that into my candle dressing. And I really like that. And, and I think it's really fun when you can kind of learn learn something new that you can kind of take with you and that sticks with you. Even if like you don't, even if the entire class isn't memorable, if you can remember like one little gem, it's, it's always a good class, I think. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. <laughs> I always think about a class that I didn't even take. <laughs> mm-hmm. When we were in Salem, you took a class with, I believe it was Peter Patton. Oh uh, yeah. The, uh, the transpossession class. Yeah. And yeah. you had told me about it later and we had kind of practiced some of the techniques that he had mentioned. And yes. I immediately felt some of the, the signs that he talked about that would yeah. happen that I didn't know about. Yep. And like you, like, as I'm telling them to you, I was like, you know, Corey, this is weird. I feel like there's something on my neck and like my yeah. head is getting really heavy. And you were like, <laughs> Oh, but that's exactly what we talked about. That's yep. normal. That to like, that's it's happening basically. Yeah. So I still think about that class and I wasn't even there. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, he was, I will say this. He is, it was a shame to lose him. He was a great teacher. Yeah. <laughs> he was really good at what he did. And that was a great class. That was a really excellent class. So yeah, there's, again, like we have some of these like classes that we could point back to at different like festivals and gatherings that we've been to and different workshops. I love them. I love them all. Keldon did a really good one this past Mystic South that was all about history of the devil and witchcraft, which is it's always fun because Keldon does a lot of good research. And so it was fun to sort of have have him sort of be like, so I know you've heard there's no devil in the crowd, but let's just put that aside for a second and say, <laughs> what if there is? <laughs> and like kind of go through some of the historical stuff with that. And it was really fun. But I wouldn't necessarily say like I learned something that I'm going to use magically from that. It was just a really informative class. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's definitely a, a difference between like an academic versus a practical. Yes. And, you know, both have, both are fun, I, but I've I've taken more academic than I have the practical type and mm-hmm. I would like to take more of the practical type of like actually doing something and you know leaving with a, a, a new skill or a new method like you said of you know the dressing candles thing or something like that that I could yeah. take with me absolutely you know I did an online um curanderismo course with Cheo Torres who wrote the book curandero and he teaches this class he's a University of New Mexico professor and he teaches a class on curanderismo during the summers and one summer he offered it as an online course and I took that and I still think of stuff from that course and I loved loved that course and it was very practical it was a lot of like the first half is informational and then the second half is here's how it works and here's how you would do it if you were practicing and I'm not saying like I want to go out and like I'm not going to go try to sell myself as a curandero but understanding those practical techniques helps me to go oh okay okay so the type of fire cupping that they're doing in this one version of curanderismo is is basically it's a type of massage it's a deep tissue massage and so that can do some really interesting things for your body right I've and so had it's that just before. and it's it, it's amazing right you get this kind of interesting release from that mm-hmm. and it's yeah it was fascinating to kind of see these different things at play and go and it went beyond kind of what i think just book learning would have said about curanderismo because it's it's so much more on the ground and he had, he had actual curanderos and curanderos they're teaching parts of the course, which yeah. is fantastic. So, yeah. So, yeah, I really think, you know, I've taken a lot of really good classes, probably too many to mention, but I really appreciate these classes that do have that just little bit of a practical edge that I can walk away and go like, huh, I now have a new skill at my fingertips. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. That being said, do you still feel like you learn from books? Yeah, I do. I really like having, like having new books. It. I don't know. That's just how I've always been. I've always been a book person, but yeah, I I still love, you know, walking into Barnes and Noble and looking in the, whatever they've decided to name it now. Like it's not new age anymore. Something like that. I don't know. (laughs) 
<laughs> they keep changing it. It's frustrating. <laughs> but yeah, I'm looking in the new age section basically, and yeah, just seeing what's what's there. And I, I also like to do that because it gives a like a macro view of Mm -hmm. a bunch of different, obviously not all of them because usually Barnes and Noble is just like Llewellyn and, uh, you know, a couple others. Right. Mm. So, (laughs) and even then it's not even all like the Llewellyn. Oh, I'm I'm aware. Stock. Yes. Yes. (laughs) We're aware. (laughs) So that's frustrating, but it is interesting to kind of like get a zoomed out view of what is popular right now. Like what is kind of in the witchcraft community what's important right now yeah i think that's true yeah yeah i feel like last year i remember going and or maybe maybe it was like two years ago it doesn't matter but a few years ago i and seeing like a lot of books on hecate and Mm -hmm. that was really interesting and like unlocking you know the key to magic with hecate there was a lot of that type of uh, just books that i i feel like i saw and i also see a lot of kind of one-on-one types now that I never used to see like in Joanne you know like the Mm -hmm. fabric (laughs) craft store yeah a ton of witchy type books now a lot of them are kind of the possibly written by AI Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know the type of book like they don't I mean I've never bought one I'm not speaking to anyone in particular I don't know but I'm just saying like it's it's way more common now and yeah. easier to access yeah for sure yeah i can't remember what it's like rock ridge press or something like that that does a lot of the kind of like ai or quasi ai generated and mm. so you wind up with a lot of like books that are you know just they're really designed to fit an algorithm more than more than written from the heart kind of a thing yeah which i mean so, i mean that is what it is but that's definitely something to be careful of yeah yeah, but. <laughs> but I mean, but, you know, I, I agree. Yeah. And it's really fun to like when I walk into books a million as opposed to other places, I'd like to see, like like you said, see what kind of the trends are. So like I know like right now I've seen a lot of like cannabis oriented witchcraft mm. books that have been out in the past like year, year and a half. And yes. so like, that's everything. But I've seen um, more of them recently. But it's so, a trend. Like, yeah. yeah. And it's something that you notice by going into a bookstore and just looking around <laughs> yeah and it makes me feel like oh i should probably know something about that so yeah 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 it gives you an avenue to to learn about so even yeah. if i then go home and you know google or ask in a forum or on our discourse you know something like that like mm-hmm. I, I still like the book still initiated that and I, I mean and i am not one to just get ideas from books and they'll you know and never buy them either obviously i just said i love books so <laughs> i have a lot that i'm that are sitting on the to read pile but yeah for sure. Well, I mean, that you talked about going home and Googling it. That kind of brings us to our last real last, last couple of points here. One being, you know, we've, you know, 2012, we had social media, the face, you know, Facebook is there and Twitter is there, but, but it has really become its own thing, right? Like you have people who are really learning witchcraft through TikTok or through Instagram or and documenting YouTube. that the learning as well. Yeah. A lot of people, mm-hmm. you know, are kind of, vlogging it <laughs> and it's not yeah. called that anymore but that's basically what it is yeah my you know, like kind of a micro vlog almost yeah so. and so i'm kind of curious you know like do you feel like you learn any anything from that you know do you ever learn from you know people in person as opposed to that or do you feel like you learn more from people kind of in an online space i i, I think i have to say i learn more from online because i'm just not in person with witches very much unfortunately Mm -hmm. i wish i was i just don't i don't have that opportunity very much but so the uh, you know a lot of the the learning and the interaction that i get is from instagram the podcast discord yeah so fair enough and yeah and i definitely i definitely like i said the discord server that we have very much very much is a learning space and I, and that's a place where i can trust a lot of the information because <laughs> I, I i don't know if it's just because of who we are as people and the people we have kind of sort of nodded around us by by dint of luck or skill i don't know how but i'm glad that we have them 
they tend to be very research oriented <laughs> so mm-hmm. they'll find sources every time mm-hmm. and i think that's one of the drawbacks when you are picking stuff up off of youtube or tiktok is that you really have to make sure that you're verifying sources because some folks really just become a kind of a cult of personality more than anything yeah. but but you can learn from those i think i think those are perfectly valid i will say like I do love the opportunity to learn in person. That's one of my favorite things about things like Mystic South as a conference is if I'm going to learn, if I want to go sit in, sit in on somebody's presentation, like that feels like a great way to learn. And there's a Q&A section there that is just, there's something about that the question and answer component of it. That that's what I need, I think, especially when I'm trying to learn something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Same. Which I mean, very much comments like a, are fine. A visual but. learner, a, a doer. Like I, I, I can't just talk about it. I have to actually yeah. do it before I understand it. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Well, okay. So then let's flip that around and talk about teaching witchcraft. And I, and I feel like I feel like on your end, you could be like, oh, well, you know, I haven't really taught any witchcraft. But I don't think no. that's true. I think you have. No, I, I'm not going to fight you on it. Like okay. looking at your notes, I'm like, okay, yeah, he's right. <laughs> and say, I like just, we have. I just don't think it's it's necessarily as like a traditional of a teaching as you mm-hmm. have done necessarily, but I have helped you with, you know, workshops and things like that. So for sure. Then, yeah. But then, I mean, just the podcast and, you know, we say like, we're not experts. We're not the last word on any of this. We're not the end all beat all, whatever, but we we're sharing information, which, you know, we hope is a well researched, hopefully fun type of way. And so, yeah, we're, we're teaching on some level mm-hmm. with this. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's, it's one of those situations where, you know, we could, we could say like, Oh, the podcast is just entertainment. And I think it is entertainment, but I think that we have introduced ideas and information. We, we have people write into us quite a lot asking for more information or sharing their experiences, which means that we are hitting on something that I think, you know, that, that shows that we are, we are getting some, ideas about folk magic and witchcraft out there that people either haven't considered before or that hopefully people are identifying within their own practices and things like that. So I really do think, and I'm not trying to toot our horn here because I don't, I'm not, this could just as well be like a broken clock being right twice a day. But (laughs) I think the fact that we have been doing podcasting for as long as we have, and that we found such a specific niche topic kind of so early into this that we have become that we've become kind of a a teaching source for some folks regarding folk magic which is uh, you know i would i would say don't don't trust something just because it comes from us please like go look up the sources that we're mentioning too and look at those and unpack those more um but like i do like that we have been able to put people onto some like i think i think we may be responsible for a huge boost in the sales of this basically out of print book called the silver bullet which is a bunch of Appalachian witchcraft stories <laughs> just because we mentioned it so much. And, and I feel like, it, I feel like at least one person out there has gone and bought Judica Elish's book because we're so enthusiastic. Uh, surely it. someone has. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, so I do feel like, you know, we could have a positive experience teaching that way, but I also think you, so you, and you may, I don't know how you feel about this. You've actually had friends who have kind of learned witchcraft not necessarily like you teaching them in a formal way, but like you have done witchcraft and they have kind of learned how to do certain things by doing it with you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and same for me learning from you. Mm-hmm. I mean, and same from you learning from, you know, the, the coven that we would work with occasionally. And mm-hmm. we taught some things to that coven to make it all come full circle. You know, like mm-hmm. I remember teaching the, treading the mill method to them yep. you know they they did not know it they didn't understand it well that's that's rude to say i don't mean it like that it's just you know it it wasn't part of their like witchy lexicon right and right. we in, introduced that to them and taught it to them and it, it ended up being pretty powerful and pretty cool so yeah that was that was neat and i i guess my whole point is that yes i i can teach something to to someone but again doesn't make me better doesn't make me you know any of that stuff i guess i just want to make that clear no but i think that's what that's what's kind of wonderful and what we're kind of getting at here is that this that witchcraft often kind of works best when it's a mutually um instructive interaction right where people are learning yeah. from each other um 
you know, the, the fact that and going to a workshop and learning from somebody is great, but there are people who like, you know, I just recently did that workshop on the dumb supper, right? The, and I'm, I'm using that as a historical term as well, that we would call it the silent supper today, but historically it was called this other thing. And it was interesting because we had, we had somebody in there who was able to kind of point to a source or an idea that I hadn't, hadn't considered yet. And that's wonderful. Like, that's exactly what I want. I want people to be able to kind of point me towards something to go like, oh, I need to expand my exploration of that in this new direction. Mm-hmm. And it's incredibly helpful. It's an incredibly helpful thing to do that. So, yeah, yeah I, I feel I, like a lot of our knowledge has evolved over the years. I mean, and that's definitely a good thing. That is what we want, right? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And, and I mean, in, in doing that, it's been able to branch out in some interesting directions. So, like this past year, we did that sleepover workshop, right? The sleepover games workshop. Mm hmm. And people got to try all kinds of stuff that they hadn't done before. And we got to kind of guide people through that. And there were some things that people tried that they really loved, some things that people were like, this is, you know, totally different. That I've you know, never experienced some that they're like, oh, this is bunk. Obviously, okay. like this is all, this is just designed to be a scary game. But then some that are like, oh, this interesting egg cracking in a glass that goes back to, you know, colonial era practices or beyond oh, this is interesting. What do I see here? And like, you know, watching people kind of discover some of these different practices that then, you know, also makes me go like, hmm, what can I incorporate from that too? So I right. love that. And then they'll share, they'll share their experiences. So, mm-hmm. Which, And it's always yeah. like brand new baby witches who are like, well, I don't have anything to, to share. And it's like, yes, you do. I promise you, you do. totally do. <laughs> what were some, you know, like, what were some things your mom always said growing up? What are some weird idioms that you you've heard growing up you know yeah. like what, what do you throw at a wedding you know yeah like, just random stuff like that yeah what do you do when somebody dies like yeah exactly yeah you you do i promise <laughs> yeah yeah it's there yeah and that's and people want people basically want to have traditions that are packaged and in, in handed to them you know charm style in the ancient book yeah <laughs> it's true i mean and it, that would make it easier i i admit i would like that as well i mean i mm-hmm. feel like that's that is a <laughs> that's part of the dream of being a witch right like you you sure. find this magic book in the attic and it answers every question you ever had like right like that's right of course it's the fantasy but you know uh, the actuality of magic is that it's a lot of work obviously yeah (laughs) and if you want that book you gotta make it your damn self (laughs) right yeah i mean this is something where a gardenerian practice is on to something with the whole like book of shadows has to be copied from the other book of shadows right Mm -hmm. but but in our case we're with folk magic it's it's less formal than that and you're really cobbling together lifetimes of experience into notebooks like that's kind of the best way that you can do this and you're going to find that your grandmother had a way of treating rheumatism that is rooted in stuff that's not medical, but it certainly is, is not like, like there's something kind of odd about it. Right. Uh Or she'll have like a specific prayer. She says when somebody is about to go traveling, well, why, why that particular prayer? And like those kinds of things, as you, as you see them all come together, you're like, Oh, that is the tradition. And you can then sort of analyze how that works within your own life. And I think that's part of the teaching process too, is to get people to see that they have this stuff and i think you're right i love that you're like you have this you have more of this than you know you do so (laughs) you have more power than you think you do (laughs) exactly okay i guess just kind of final point here do you when you when you are teaching do you prefer to teach kind of in just like a one-on-one setting or do you do you do you like doing this kind of workshops or is it just kind of context dependent for you yeah, context. I would say I'm, I do get stage fright pretty badly. So being in just in front of large groups is hard for me, regardless. I get very nervous. And it's so funny because, like, if everybody who was listening to like this episode was in a, I, I don't know, like a auditorium or whatever, I would be like, ah, ah, I'm not mm. a teacher, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> but I yeah. can just, I can talk to you. But like, it's, I know that it's going out to so many people, but, it's it's just not the same so yeah (laughs) sure group teaching is is harder for me but at the same time I also feel like such a know-it-all like when I'm teaching one-on-one I really try not to come across as like just you know that person so uh, you're gonna get some therapy and unpack that because you are knowledgeable you've reached the age of being knowledgeable you have experience to draw upon (laughs) not saying that you have to like 
Yeah. There's a difference between sharing knowledge and being a know-it-all. No. And I, I try not to come across as a know-it-all. Like I, there's a, you know, intent of not being one, but yes. that may not come across all the time, I guess. Yeah. Cause I just, I love to share knowledge. That's the thing. Like I love to share trivia and like when there's something cool, I know I'm like, Oh, did you know this? And it sometimes I do feel like it comes across as like, Oh, well, did you, know, I know more about this than you, you know? And I just, I, I guess I try to be mindful of that. Yeah, no, and I understand that. I also think that there's like, you know, that I need uh, therapy. Yeah, no, well, you're right. All of us, you're, all of you're us right. do. <laughs> you're right about that. But no, the info dumping component of that is very much like it's an enthusiasm thing. I don't yes. think it gets read as condescension in any way. Okay, good, good. I don't read it that way. So, because if anybody's condescending, <laughs> so it is me. <laughs> you know, I'm a doctor. Yes. <laughs> Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah. I can't even tell you how many ad bill to take if you have a headache. Just leave, leave it alone. It's nothing. Goodness gracious. Okay. We're going to take just a quick pause and then we're going to come back and talk about school supply magic. Okay. So school supplies, school supply magic. There's a kind of a couple of like pieces of superstition and folklore, but I'm kind of curious. I just want to kind of start off with when I say school supplies and magic or school supplies and superstition or school supplies and ritual or anything like that, does anything pop to mind for you? Pens and pencils are kind of the main one. Mm -hmm. I feel like for a lot of school supplies now, some of them are more modern, you know, like post-its and highlighters. I, I don't know, just things of that nature. Like they're, they, they don't really, I mean, they can be used, don't get me wrong, as magical, absolutely. But the the ones I tend to think of more like folk magic type stuff is just like i said pens and pencils what about mm. you any anything different the first thing that pops to mind are cootie catchers like that's the very first thing that comes to my mind is the like oh, the yeah. little paper fortune tellers because specifically they are fortune tellers so yes. and you made those at the at the workshop at Miss yeah we did that was so yeah. fun that was you were teaching that that you were you were the the instructor for that <laughs> and so that's just one of those things where like again you know, do you take it seriously? No, but is there also a hint of like, well, it is, you know, it's a game of chance that gives you a fortune. So could be something you use magically if you wanted it to, mm -hmm. to be that. So I think that's kind of neat. And then, and then, yeah. And then I do think of pens and pencils and stuff like that, or, you know, making sigils on paper and stuff like that. So yeah. Notebooks, journals. Yeah. I'll tell you, I've recommended this show a billion and one times, but there's a show called Owl House on Disney <laughs> Plus. And, you know, she's she's going to a magical school in a world full of, you know, demons and witches and things like that. And she's a human that's kind of crossed this threshold to, to be in this world. But she doesn't have magic until she discovers that there are sigils that will activate little pockets of magic in that world. And so she starts learning how to draw these sigils on little scraps of paper and she just keeps all these papers with her so that she can activate them when she needs to. So she becomes very fluid or fluent in the language of the written language of magic. And I, that always makes me think of like, that's, that's a very, like, I just want to post it pad full of like sigils. Like just be like slap it on stuff. So Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. I don't think I realized that Owl House was about um, like a school. Yeah. 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 It's a fantastic show. It is such a good show. It's from the same, it's sort of from the same people who did Gravity Falls. So yeah, that's what it, it, to me, it always seemed like a mix of Gravity Falls and like David the Gnome, maybe. Mm, you know, the David the Gnome is, is, is out there. No, it's, it is very, it's a little punk. It's a little punk rock or a little punk oh. rock. Very, very cool. And it's got, a, it's got an amazing story and an amazing arc. So definitely okay. check it out. Yeah. And also Schools of Magic. Love that. So that's true. Okay. I do have some folklore and I'll, what I'd like to do is maybe kind of go through a couple categories and share the folklore. And then maybe we can kind of talk about like, well, what's some other lore that we can think of that might connect to this? Or can we think of similar or different uses for this or things like that? Okay. So the first one I have, and this is from the Frank C. Brown collection of North Carolina lore, is that you shouldn't write on the first page of a new pack of paper or you'll have bad luck. Well, what are you supposed to do with it? You just throw it away. That's mm, that's wasting a that's wasting a tree. I'm not or, down for that. Or you, or you make a cootie, cootie catcher. There you go. You make your cootie. Well, you'd still be writing on it if you do that. But <laughs> that's true. But you could just make something out of it. Yeah, you can make a little hat or something out of it. Just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Made me think of an airplane. You know, like I can make a brooch. Uh, I can make a hat. hat. <laughs> yes. 
full of contemporary references we are. I love it. Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, I think this has to do with the idea of like, you don't want to be the one to like, there's always a sort of taboo about being the the first person to cross the threshold on something Mm -hmm. or the first person to like, this, this is the whole, like why you, why I'm not saying this is why you should do this, but this is why this is part of the lore. Like when you were digging up mandrake roots, they would tie them to dogs, right? Because the dog was the one that was then digging the mandrake root up. So if the mandrake screamed, it would kill the dog. <laughs> you know? uh, oh, so it wasn't the first person who heard it. It was just, or the first creature that heard it. It was whoever dug it up. Yeah. When it, when it gets dug up, it screams. And so you'd let the dog do the pulling so that the dog would die. And then you could go collect the mandrake root. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. I misunderstood that. But yeah, that's a little sad. It's like, it's like the royal taster. <laughs> yes. Yep. Pretty much. Yep. I don't sad. think there's any poison. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. But so, yeah, this is that same, like, don't cross, don't be the first one to write on the the blank new thing, the the virgin paper as it, as it might be, mm. terms, you know, so, because that's going to mean that you have done, you have blotted something or you have. Sullied you know, it sullied it and therefore you have a, a price to pay or something like that hmm. but i bet you could give it away to your enemy it'd be an interesting way to do like a little curse wouldn't it oh like give your enemy the first sheet of a new pack, pack of paper and let them be the one to write on it and get the bad luck yeah that one kid who never brings paper you get you save that paper yeah. for them <laughs> save all of your first pages and then just give them a stack of it <laughs> <laughs> here <laughs> here you go here you go, Braden. <laughs> Have as much paper as you need, Braden. <laughs> you know, there's one Braden that's listening that l- just looked around like, "What did I do?" <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Braden. That's not. Your fault. <laughs> I'm we sorry, you, Braden. <laughs> we do love you, Braden. Okay, next one is: it's bad luck to drop your books unless someone picks them up for you. But you can also kiss a dropped book that will reverse the bad luck. Never heard this. I think it's cute. It it just gives me like images of i don't know the 50s and like girls yeah. walking around in big poodle skirts and like <laughs> pinning you know to their letterman jackets and things like that i don't know that's just what that that made me think of yeah that's funny <laughs> yeah i mean if you're you're not wrong that is kind of the first mental image that pops in my head is like you know i dropped my books and he picked them up for me yeah okay. it's like it's like oh margaret you dropped your books <laughs> oh thanks you can call me peggy you know that type of thing yeah yeah <laughs> you can call me biff <laughs> whatever yeah and then the kissing the drop book i think that's interesting kisses often are a way to reverse bad luck i, th- I think that's fascinating that kisses mm-hmm. kisses are a, i don't know there's just this, this moment of affection that can be used to sort of deflect bad things it's the power can of you kiss. think of <laughs> can you think of other things like quick things off the top of your head that because for me i think of going under a yellow light yeah, yeah we would often yeah padiddle like, that's yeah. what we called it too we would often like you know kiss our hand and then push it to the the roof as we were going through of like yeah. a hey let's not get hit let's not get pulled over yep. you know that type of thing yeah that was the first one that was one that popped to mind too and i think there's one where you can like blow a kiss over your shoulder with like you like if you've got bad luck or if you feel like you've been like cursed by somebody mm, like so. like the spilled salt type of deal yeah exactly a little bit yeah, yeah. okay mm-hmm. so yeah i just think that's neat okay pencils lots of stuff with pencils i mentioned or i, I sort of teased the idea of charlie charlie which for those who don't know charlie charlie is a fortune telling game involving balancing one pencil on top of the other and using yes no quadrants you can find it very easily by googling it on youtube and seeing how it works it is as we as we showed during our workshop it is the it is usually used as a kind of scam to scare people because you kind of blow on Mm. the pencil to make it Mm -hmm. move but some people seem to have luck with it i don't know interesting okay what about this piece of lore a pencil tip breaking means someone is talking about you or spreading lies or gossip or that you're gonna have bad luck Hmm. i don't think i've ever heard that one either but I like it, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. like sometimes just pieces of lore kind of wedge their way into your brain. I feel like that's one that's going to wedge its way in. Yeah. I mean, I think the pencil tip breaking, I, I do remember that being like, oh, it's going to be a bad day if your pencil tip breaks early in the day. I remember that from like elementary school type stuff, but. 
Yeah, I've always preferred mechanical pencils. <laughs> yeah, those, those break. It's a pain in the butt to deal with other than reload the stupid things, but but they do make nicer lines. So it's true. And that is good for sketching because you don't get that. You can't do the like side of the pencil shading and stuff like that. Mm. Finding a pencil on the ground is good luck. This is kind of in the see a see a penny pick it up vein. Never heard that either. Do you pick up pencils if you find them? No, not usually. Is it because you're like, that's gross. It's probably been in somebody's mouth. Probably, yeah. And yeah. again, because I don't like to use pencils, especially, you know, uh, just regular ones <laughs> that aren't mechanical. No pencil. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. Your Get out of here with your pencil. Yeah. Okay. So we mentioned Charlie Charlie. Oh, this was an interesting one. This is from, from Henry Harry Middleton Hyatt's Folklore of Adams County. But you can circle things that you want to go away using the tips of pencils. So, for example, if you have warts or freckles, you can draw circles around them and they will go away. Hmm. That kind of makes sense in a way to me. It's like, you know, the lead is erasable and mm-hmm. to kind of, and it, I, I guess it would fade away after a while, uh-huh. you know, just on paper, just using it as you normally would. So that, that makes sense to try to use that. Yeah. Could you imagine like drawing a circle around somebody's house? Oh. Ooh. <laughs> or around Braden? <laughs> Get out of here, Braden. <laughs> you just throw a bunch of pencils at him. <laughs> Get out of here. Take your yeah. pencils. You fling enough pencils at Braden, he's going to leave. Yeah. He's going to have to go to the hospital. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> moving on to pens. And this is sort of the bridge point between the two. I think this is from, I think this is from, also from the Hyatt collection. Don't write a love letter with pencil because it means your love will grow cold. Yeah, same deal. It's erasable, that type of deal. Mm -hmm. I feel like writing it in pen is more permanent, more like showing your commitment. So that makes sense. Okay. And I'm curious about these next two, because these have to do with the ink colors. Using blue ink in a love letter, a girl tells her beau she is true to him. But using red ink in a love letter is a sign of passionate love. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Did you ever like change out your ink colors for intent? Yes. Yeah. When I first started doing like my first, what I wanted to be like a book of shadows type of deal. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, I got a bunch of kind of calligraphy markers, I guess they were. I don't mm-hmm. know. And yeah, I would kind of color coded what I was then writing about. Yeah. In my, yeah, ju- just journal, whatever it was yeah. at the time mm-hmm. that I was using to, like I yeah. said, try to make a, usable book of shadows yeah yeah it's interesting yeah i don't know that i would go so i mean i think i would use if i were doing a spell that involved passionate love i might actually do red ink but like i don't think i would just assume that a love letter written in red ink because actually i would feel like sending somebody a letter in red ink would feel a little bit like getting like a howler like it would feel like it was yeah. angry yeah the the red ink is so teacher Yes. And the school bound to me, which is funny because that's what we're talking about. But mm-hmm. like it, it would not be. Ooh, passion to me, it would be like, oh, I got a bad grade. And then it would be OK, <laughs> but it's it's good words. It's OK. But my immediate reaction would be like, no, red ain't bad. You know? Yeah. Are they are they angry? Did I do something wrong? Yeah. 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 I just think that's interesting. Um, and this isn't on our list, but I'm just curious. Do you have a like. Do you find that there are certain types of like using pens and inks and things like that that are more suited to magic? So, for example, do you like using quill and liquid ink or like fountain pens or anything like that when you're doing magical work? I do, especially because you can use different things as quills. Mm -hmm. I spoke about this before, but, you know, I've used like a particularly thick whisker (laughs) Mm -hmm. from not my cats because they haven't shed one that I've been able to catch yet, but in, in the past I've used one and it, you know, it's, it's very thin lines, obviously, but if you're just making like a little sigil, it's perfect. So I really like to do that. And that you can't really get that with just a regular pen unless you kind of break it open or whatever. But I also really like, like jelly roll type pens, you know, there's all kinds of different colors and I definitely write in journals. And then, you know, I have like a, a magical journal uh, or, or like planner, I guess um, that i write different things in and I even you know just mundane things I color code on planners like my husband is always green my daughter is usually like a pink or a red and then I'm I'm blue so like all our stuff is kind of color coded so I can look at it and be like oh my daughter has a ton of stuff going on that day you know things like Mm -hmm. that 
Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, you start to assign intention, you know, intention through the color coding, which is kind of cool. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, yeah. for me, I, I like the I like the feel of like a fountain pen or liquid ink. Like there's something about that that really does feel like I'm. It's it, not that it feels more permanent, but it feels like it feels like I'm fixing something into place because the ink kind of bleeds out and then stops. Mm-hmm. And it's this interesting thing that sort of happens where it's like you can you can sort of see the bleed and the, the stop, and it's like it's it's like in motion and then it's not. So it's like it's crystallizing before your eyes. There's a magical thing that happens with it. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I've got just a little, like a little fountain pen that I really like. Um, yeah, I enjoy using for stuff. But then we've also talked about like I also like loading up the barrels of pens with like psalm scrolls and stuff like that too. Yeah, I feel like we talk about that every time, but it's I so I clever. Know. I love it. Like it's such a it's like one of my go tos. I love that. It's pretty effective. It's yeah. worked for me, you know. Yeah. Okay. Any other magical school supplies that you can think of? Because I, that that was just kind of a list of some that we had some folklore and superstition about. Are there other school supplies that you think of and you're like, ooh, that could totally be magical or that I would use magically? Like, you know, like for me, I'll, I'll start, start it off and then you can kind of run okay. from, well, I'll let you think about this for a second. But post-it notes. For me, post-it notes are like super wonderful magical tools because kind of the Owl House thing, you can put a sigil on them and stick them under something and no one's going to see it there. And so you can put like a petition or a sigil kind of under something or this is something I love to do. You can fold them because the sticky is pretty sticky, but if you kind of rub at it, it'll mostly go away and you can fold mm-hmm. them into origami. And I love making the little origami birds and stuff like that and just leaving them and like using those as like little, little tokens of like peace or like little gifts of like little offerings um, as mm-hmm. a way of sort of like add something to a space. Um, and I feel like you could, if you, you could do that with all kinds of animals, so if you wanted something, if you needed like, um, you know, eyes. You wanted to be informed out about what was going on in a place, and you happen to be there. Um, you could fold up a little origami like owl or something and leave it there. Like it could sort of be watching for you there. You know, mm-hmm. I sort of love love using sticky notes in that capacity. And I also think you know, sticky notes. There's just something kind of magical about the idea of sticky notes in general. Where like you write a tiny little note, you stick it somewhere, and it's hidden, and it's this like little surprise that somebody gets and i love that about it too <laughs> we really love school supplies here <laughs> <laughs> we do. What about you? What's, what's one that you like well i don't know how magical it is in itself but it it kind and again i'm sorry to be like this person but it makes me think of our book with mm-hmm. kind of purse magic with backpacks mm-hmm. you know they do carry a lot of stuff and they have all kind of their own little compartments and you know, this one specifically is meant for your laptop and this one specifically is meant for your books. And I don't know that, you know, these are little pen holders and I just think you could do something with that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you can make a backpack have a lot of personality too, mm-hmm. like with pins or patches or drawing on it and things like that. I think there's a lot that you can do to make it kind of a little like enchanted, like a bag of holding as it were, you know? Right. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like there's a lot of other school supplies we could probably get into, like glue. I think you can obviously do a lot with glue where like you can create sigils with glue that then also you can use to stick things together. I think that's kind of fun. Yeah, you can. (laughs) This is so strange, but this is where my brain goes. So I automatically think of taking glue and putting it on your hand and letting it dry, right? Yeah, like alien skin. Right. And so like, it was like, not cool like ooh, they're cool but it was like an accomplishment if if you could like get it off in one pull like as one piece Uh i wonder if you could do something with that or like make a a shape or draw a simple something on your skin and then you know kind of peel it up and do something with that dried skin Uh, ew gross that dried glue (laughs) that came that's so disgusting (laughs) it's got some of your skin on it i mean it's pulling particles yeah probably yeah but i don't know just because that's that's so like just elementary school to me <laughs> well i mean it makes me think of the, like peeling an apple all in one go right mm, so like yeah. if you could if you drew something on your hand and they peel it off like it would tell you if your wish came true it could be a little mini divination i could see that mm-hmm. and and i'm not going to underestimate the power of scotch tape as a school supply which you can you know, use to lift people's fingerprints or collect their hair for whatever reason you know <laughs> very easy to do that <laughs> yep shady <laughs> 
I mean, I feel like we could, you know, make arguments that like a ruler could be used as a wand and stuff like that. But I mean, I don't have a practical use for it. Although I did use, we did use the metal edges of rulers. We would sort of heat them up by rubbing them on a shoe until they were like hot. And then you could like yeah. push them against your skin and it would feel like it was burning. Yeah. I feel like that could be something, but I don't know what. <laughs> so, oh. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, like, yeah, I would have to think about that, but that could be fun to to play with. Like, you know, we used to kind of sit down and brainstorm different uh, uses for a particular object. Yeah. Um, and I feel like a ruler would be a fun one to sit down with. For sure. Yeah. And then if you have a calculator, you can use that as a conjuring instrument. You can uh, you can summon boobs really <laughs> easily. You just use the magical <laughs> square number of five eight zero zero eight. <laughs> And then you take the inverse <laughs> position of the. <laughs> Sorry. I don't need to summon boobs. All right. I got them. I'm good. <laughs> You're like, I got plenty of boobs. I had some cut off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a plethora. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Any what other else? school supplies we can think of? Oh, my God. I keep wanting to say highlighters. Again, I don't mm-hmm. really know of a use for them, but it, I mean, it. It brings something to the to the front. It obviously highlights it, but mm-hmm. it can highlight it in your brain as well. It can definitely tell you to focus on something more. And so I, I, th- I feel like that could be used in some way. Yeah, I think that would make some sense. Mm-hmm. And you can also, I think you can, like you can put hand sanitizer in water and mix it up and then put the highlighter tip in it. And it'll start to suck the color out of it. Oh. I might be mistaken about that. There's some way you can do this where like you can suck the highlighter color out of it but it leaves like a film of the color and you can pick that color up and put it on something else. So. Ooh, cool. Yeah. I don't really look, look for science experiments that do this. This is not something I'm, I can describe. Yeah. <laughs> no, podcast. I get you. I get you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Other school supplies. Erasers. I think obviously can kind of remove mistakes and things like that. Mm-hmm. And on it. Well, actually, okay. This is good. This is a wild one, but I'm curious what you think of it. Okay. So there's this thing that you can do with like those pink erasers, right? And thumbtacks where you can turn them into little dolls. Like you can give them two arms, two legs and a head, right? Oh yeah. Like you just smush it into the yeah the eraser. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you could then use that as a poppet. <laughs> I think you could. Do. Yeah. So there's a thought for folks if they're out there looking for, for magic. <laughs> I feel like we've talked about paper clips and stuff like that in like office supply episodes. So I think you could use paper clips and staples to like bind things together and all that. But Mm -hmm. crayons, this is a totally separate thing, but like you can save broken crayons and turn them into candles. You can mix them with wax and turn them into candles. That's true. So, yeah. Which then you could use for a certain intention based on color or maybe even like the crayon's name. I I know. say that, yeah. (laughs) Crayola has so many fun names. Like I remember when I was in elementary school they were having a contest to name some of the new colors and like the kids got their names on the crayons Mm -hmm. with their age next to it and I remember like Robin's Egg Blue was one and Purple Mountain's Majesty was one so yeah I I don't know I just I think that's that's really fun but Purple's Mountain Majesty always makes me think of obviously it's purple so you know like royalty that type of stuff but it makes me think of the the song as well, you know, mm-hmm. like the patriotic song. So when I want to be not so obviously like red, white, and blue, yay, I could, I could maybe like use that purple crayon for something, you know, <laughs> that's so like, that's maybe a reach for some people, but I don't know. That's just kind of how my, my brain works. Yeah. And if you, and if you mixed red and blue, you would get purple and then oh, white you so used to kind of change the tone of the purple. So that's interesting. So I hadn't ever thought of that until you said you put all that in one sentence and like, oh my gosh. So purple is this kind of interesting red, white, and blue, but it's a twist on it that I like. It's fun. <laughs> I like that. It is. A lot. Yeah. And if you go to the Crayola, if you go to Crayola world in Pennsylvania, you can design your own crayon color and stuff like that. So Ooh, fun. So you get to do melted crayon art and stuff. So. Okay. I think we've touched on a lot of like random school mm-hmm. supply stuff. So I'd really be interested to hear other people use in their school supplies. Like what are you, what do you all out there imagine as like, what are some school supplies that we miss that you're like, Oh, you know, lunch boxes or, Oh, pencil cases, or, you know, maybe trapper keepers, like trapper keep. I've always, I've actually long thought about like how much I would love to have like a magical book of shadows. That was just a trapper keeper. 
<laughs> I bought a retro Trapper Keeper last school supply year because it made me so happy. It's got like the 90s, mm-hmm. you know, like vaporwave mm-hmm. aesthetic. Yeah, for I sure. love it. And then, so, you know, my friend that is younger than, uh, yes. you know, by mm-hmm. about a, a decade, you know, like we have yes. a little bit of an age gap and she is absolutely lovely, but, and will it be the first to admit she grew up under two rocks. Okay. Not just one. <laughs> like there was another one stacked on top of her <laughs> and she was like, what's a trapper keeper. And I was uh, like, girl, <laughs> let me educate you. <laughs> So I had to like send her a picture of my trapper keeper. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we, we, so if you don't know what one is, I beg of you to, to Google it because it was imperative to my elementary school success. I, like I picture you like slap brace, letting yourself to her like handcuff style and dragging her to the yes. store. Yes. Be like, this one is pretty cool, but see mine was Lisa Frank. So yes. Mine has the psychedelic dolphins on it. So. Yeah, I'm pretty sure mine did have the psychedelic dolphins. It was either that <laughs> or the ballerina bunnies. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> okay, okay. So Moving trapper on, keepers. Fun. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I feel like there's a lot. I would love to know what people what people think of when they think of school supplies and magic, because I'm sure there are a lot of people that have come up with great school supply magical uses. So, uh, and I bet most of them are teachers. <laughs> Probably <laughs> Athena Beth. Get on here, honey. We need you. Seriously. For sure. Okay. Well, we don't have a listener email this time, and which is good because we're already running kind of long, but I did want to kind of have a question of the episode. And I'm just curious, you know, uh, we mentioned Owl House earlier. That's got a magical school in it, right? There's a lot of stories that have like these magical schools where you learn magic in some capacity or another. And I just wanted to kind of toss it out as a question for us to think about. If you were setting up a magical school or a school of magic, like, how would you do it? Like, how would you set it up? What would be subjects you would teach? Like, like, how would you like, like, would you want it to be really, really grounded in reality? Or do you just imagine it as being a very fantasy sort of a thing? Like, you know, what's in your head? And like, for uh, me, it's grounded in reality. It's like, very practical. Like there are, you know, like, we're, we're really trying to straddle the line between uh, just as a, I guess like an inside baseball moment here for people between talking about Harry Potter, because yeah, we're millennials deal with it. And Mm -hmm. it was a big part of our childhood and it is a big part of just the culture in general, Mm -hmm. but also, you know, like giving room to other magical things and also acknowledging that there is some really crazy (sighs) shitty things that have happened. Yeah. That, are not the, the fault of people who love Harry Potter as exactly, a world, but exactly. are the fault of a person who created this thing and then right. acted like an ass. So. Yes. And so we struggle with that with Buffy as well. Yes. And, mm-hmm. and Joss Whedon. But so, yeah, it's it's the whole thing. But I guess the, the point being, like, when I think of like the herbology class, kind of like, you know, the, the, the students go down to the greenhouses and they're working mm-hmm. with plants and they're learning things and they are hands on. And they are getting dirty. That's kind of what I would like with many different things. So like, yeah, you have a candle class, but it's like you said, with like the dressing of candles mm-hmm. and, you know, selecting, you know, your right one for the spell you want to like the right color or whatever. And the tactile feeling, you know, and like, I just see like all these tapers together and I don't know, that's kind of my, my vision. What do you, what do you think of? Well, I like that. I really like the practical element. I always think of, so one, I will say like, you know, the, the the Hogwarts school is obviously the one that I think comes to mind for a lot of us. But this is, it was not a new concept. She's not the only person to have ever come up with this. I mean, we had the worst witch. I was about to 80s. say the worst witch. Um, you know, this idea of like there being magical academies is not an unusual thing. And there were, you know, there's one, there's break bills, for example, in the, the book, The Magicians by Lev Grossman. Um, which is a very practical, realistic school that also has just little twists of fantasy elements in it, which are interesting. But the one that comes to mind for me is from an, an old movie called Bedknobs and Broomsticks. Mm-hmm. And in that one, so this Angela Lansbury character, she has been learning how to be, her name is Eglin, Eglantine Price in the movie, and she's been learning how to be a witch from the correspondence school of witchcraft, where she would like send off for lessons and get packets in the mail. And then do those and then have to send stuff back in. And then like eventually she winds up meeting the guy who's kind of set this whole thing up. He's really a scam artist, but it turns out that 
in order to make stuff seem realistic, he actually included stuff that was real. <laughs> so, right. That he just didn't realize was real. So, but like, I love the idea of like getting a packet in the mail and like unpacking it, like working your way through all the materials and that, and, like trying to figure it out. And then like at some point getting to like correspond with the person behind it and like ask questions and stuff like that. I just love that. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess a, a really recent example of kind of what I think of would be kind of the Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Like Nevermore, Nevermore. I think mm-hmm. school that yeah. is what they call it. I, I like that aesthetic and look of it and feel of it. That's kind of how I ima- maybe that's where I kind of got it from. But I, I, I like that idea. That was a fun question, Corey. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I feel like I, I feel like like what we're talking about. This is not the only way to envision it. So I loved again. I want to hear what your school supplies are that you turn into magical objects. And I want to hear what is your dream magical school like what would it be like is it one that already exists in a piece of fiction or is it one that like you you have a better vision for so because like and it doesn't even have to be fiction like a book or maybe if you ever if, if anybody ever plays skyrim for example there's this whole i think it's in winter hold or in one of, one of the kind of colder areas of skyrim they have this whole like school of magic where you can go and learn all the different magics and stuff like that so That's like, what is yeah well it's neat until you basically destroy it and get destroyed by a dragon but you know well (laughs) it is what it is you know gotta play the game (laughs) i I just Um, know that they took an arrow to the knee that's it that's all i know about the game (laughs) and like bus road doll maybe something i don't remember that but i'm sure that i'm sure it is maybe it's (laughs) something in the the actual when you use the elder scroll to summon probably the time dragon anyway wow wow we have steered that particular school bus off the cliff (laughs) Yep. but yeah we would love to hear your ideas about school supply magic your thoughts on learning witchcraft your best ways to learn best ways to teach as well as what would your ideal school of witchcraft look like so please share those with us and you can do that at compass and key at gmail.com our website is newworldwitchery.com you can stream the episodes or leave a comment or look back at our like 13 years of content <laughs> go all the way back to 2012 and find right. when we first talked about this yeah and if you're looking for us on social media or workshops that we're doing or anything like that if you're looking to learn from us in person we list our workshops and stuff like that if you go to newlebuttery.com slash find hyphen us that will list everything there so mm-hmm. patreon oh yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> You're fine. There's a Patreon. You can you can look at there. That's <laughs> patreon.com slash New World Witchery. Yes. And if you join at any level for that dollar a month or whatever, you wind up getting access to our Discord server. Like And like we said, that's actually a pretty killer magical community and a good opportunity to learn magic okay. from other knowledgeable folks there. So I think that'll about do it for us this time. So I guess it's time for us to go pack our bags and get ready for school, right? All right. Sounds good to me. Go lay out your clothes. Aw, first day of school outfit. <laughs> Hit checks. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, everybody, thanks for listening. Be well. New World Witchery is a production of New World Witchery Podcasts and is released under a Creative Commons Share and Share Alike license. The title and closing music for this episode is Woman Blues by Paul Avgernos, licensed from AudioSocket.